All right, so we started a series last week called Following Jesus. And we're basically filling in the blank. Jesus followers, you know, blank. And last week we talked about how Jesus followers are monotheistic. And we talked about the various implications of that worldview. And, and today I want to talk about how Jesus followers seek God. And more specifically, they flee sin and, and seek God. You say, well, what exactly do you mean by that? What exactly does, does that look like? Well, most of us, I'm sure, remember the story of Joseph, who was Rachel's son, which was Jacob's favorite. And so Joseph's brothers became jealous of him, and they plotted to kill him. And instead of killing him, because they're such nice guys, they threw him into a cistern and then sold him to Midianite traders. And the Midianite tra traders, in turn, sold him to Potiphar, who was a high official and captain of the king's guard in Potiphar's court. Now, Joseph worked hard. And everything he did, God prospered. And so Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes. And Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything that he had, his household, his fields, all of it. He withheld nothing from Joseph with the exception of his wife. And Potiphar slept well at night knowing that Joseph was in control, that Joseph was in charge of everything that was going on and that he had it covered. And so... Potiphar's wife notices that Joseph is well-built and handsome. That's what the text says. He's well-built and handsome. And so she says, you know, come to bed with me. And Joseph says to her, my master has given me everything that he has. He has withheld nothing from me with the exception of you, his wife. How could I do this wicked thing and sin against the Lord? But every day she continued to press him, come to bed with me, come to bed with me. Until one day, Joseph was alone in the house. And Potiphar's wife corners him and says, come to bed with me. And realizing that he's in a very precarious situation, Joseph just flees. He runs away. Well, she had a hold of his cloak. And so now she's got his cloak. And she's so angry at being spurned, she screams. And everybody runs in, and she says, this Hebrew that you have brought into this house has, has tried to force himself on me, and when I screamed, he ran away, and see, I have his cloak. Potiphar says, how could you do this, this terrible thing? I've, I've given you everything. I have withheld nothing from you with the exception of my wife. And so he has Joseph thrown into prison. It's not funny. <laughs> Judy's really happy to be back in church. <laughs> and so what does this teach us about following God? What does this teach us about sin? What does this teach us about practical spirituality? And it reveals to us that, that we should seek godliness, that we should seek goodness, that we should flee sin in order to pursue righteousness. So let's say that you have a friend who's overweight or, out, or just in really bad health. They're overweight, they uh, have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, they're pre-diabetic, the whole nine yards. And the doctor says to them, if you do not change how you eat, you are going to die. And so now your friend tells you that he is Mr. Healthy, that he's eating for his life. And so you guys go out to Outback Steakhouse for lunch. And for, as an appetizer, he orders a blooming onion, all 2,960 calories of it. And then he orders a salad. With blue cheese dressing, extra dressing, extra cheese, croutons, and bacon. Then he orders a fried chicken sandwich with onion rings on it, extra honey mustard dressing, and french fries. And you're looking at him, you know, like, and he's like, what? What? Onion, salad, chicken, it's all healthy. Now, 
He knows, and he knows that you know that this is nothing more than a rationalization. Like he should take one look at that blooming onion and just be like, you know, you know, you know, hissing at it and run, you know, run away. He should flee. He should look at any of that food and, and he should flee. Why? Because he wants to live a long and healthy life. But this is exactly how Christians often respond to sin and how we process sin. We rationalize it away as, well, you know, it's not really that bad. It's just onion salad and, 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 and chicken, so it really can't be that bad. But deep down inside, we know that sin is to our spiritual health what a blooming onion is to our physical health, that it will lead to death. And make no mistake about it, sin will lead to death. Or at least according to the Scriptures, that's what it says. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. James 1, 14 and 15, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. This is why we flee. So if the doctor tells you that you're going to die if you eat a blooming onion, not today, but you will die. It, it, it's going to happen. What do you do? Well, you flee that. You, you run away from that. And this leads to our passage today, which is 2 Timothy 2.22. And it's very simple. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. And so this is, this is Joseph's life verse. This is the perfect verse for Joseph. Furthermore, this is not an isolated verse, and especially in the New Testament. Paul talks a lot about just fleeing sin, just, just run away. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 10.14, flee from idolatry. 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 12. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Therefore, Christians are not simply to avoid sin, right? That's what we think. Okay, I'm just going to avoid this sin and I'm just going to, you know, not do it. No, we need to have a more proactive idea. We need to flee it. We need to run away. We need to put distance between us and sin. Jesus makes this perfectly clear. Matthew 5, 29 to 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. And he's speaking metaphorically, I'm sure. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And so sin is obviously a serious matter to God. And it ought to be a very serious matter for us as well. And, and I think one of the problems is that we are not necessarily all that well-versed in sin. Oh, don't get me wrong. We're really good at sinning. And, you know, we probably sin all the time. So I'm not talking about it in that regard. What I mean is, is that we don't necessarily understand the various nuances of sin and the various ways that the, the, the text or the scripture processes sin and kind of kind of lays it out so that we understand what's going on and the various dynamics with sin. And so in order to talk about fleeing sin so that we can seek God, we have to understand sin and we need to break that down for a little bit. Theologian Millard Erickson says, sin is any evil action or evil motive that is in opposition to God. Theologian Dale Moody the nature of sin is summarized in the use of the words ungodliness and unrighteousness. Ungodliness is the broken relationship with God. Unrighteousness is the broken relationship with others. And so the Bible outlines sin. And it does so by using a variety of different words 
for sin. And so what I would like to do is explore for us, for a moment, these various different words for sin. And we're only going to be able to touch on each one because the Bible uses a lot of different words for sin. But it helps us understand the dynamic when we actually go through these and we understand what each of these are. For example, the Bible uses the word rebellion, which is willful disobedience. Like we know what God desires, but we bow up against it. Like we know that God desires sex to be in a lifelong, monogamous, male-female marriage commitment. But then we bow up against that, and we sneer at that, and we do whatever it is that we want to do, even though it doesn't fit God's paradigm for sex. Then there is ignorance, or the hardening of heart. Hardening of heart is when we simply, we simply just don't care. So we ignore what God wants, and we just do what we want to do anyway. It's, it's like doing 80 and a 55, but with our lives and our behavior. The next type of sin is this idea of a transgression. We hear the word transgression. And so a transgression is disobedience to God's word or God's law. And it is a violation of the commandments. So like we know the Ten Commandments, we know the other commandments in Scripture, but we fall short of those commandments. The next word that the Bible uses for sin is the word error. Error is when we we make a mistake. We get caught up in the moment, we get caught up in the situation, and then we do something stupid, and we find that we've kind of lost our way, that we've kind of gone, and we've gone astray, and we're like, I don't even realize how I got here, but I'm here because I have done this, this stupid thing. Another term the Bible uses is inattention. Inattention is the sin of neglect. These are the things that we don't even think about it. It often is manifest in the sin of omission. We know we're supposed to forgive, but we don't even think about it. We just react. And so now we're, we're not being forgiving. Or we know we're supposed to give or, or to share our faith or to serve or, or whatever. And, and we just don't do it because we're not even thinking about it. It's inattention. The next phrase the Bible uses is missing the mark. Missing the mark is falling short of God's perfect standards of goodness and righteousness. So so we read the Sermon on the Mount. And we read, whoever looks at a woman lustfully with his eyes. Or whoever says to his brother, you fool. And we read that and we think, okay, physically I have not violated these, the commandments that are related to this. You know, do not murder, do not commit adultery. But we have missed the mark nevertheless. The next one is unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is willfully doing something that we know is not right, usually in the terms of a, of a relationship. Because the word righteousness literally means right relationship. And so when we violate the integrity of a relationship, or when we violate the spirit of a relationship, then we have committed unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is also often expressed in Scripture with the term wickedness, and we'll use those interchangeably. And this is the specific type of sin that Joseph was fleeing, because it would have been unrighteous for him to be with Potiphar's wife. The next term that the Bible uses is the term iniquity. Now, iniquity is interesting. It is an offense to the holiness of God. And iniquity is it, it's like a heavy thing. It's like a palpable thing that settles on your being, that settles on, on your soul. It, it, it is cumulative. It, it, uh, you know, it's something that needs to be cleansed or needs to be purged. And so David prays, Lord, cleanse me from my iniquity because he feels it the tongue or the 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 tongues from the the altar uh took the coal from the altar and put it on isaiah's lips and and, and it says that he has now been purged of his iniquity another word the bible uses is treachery treachery is the sin of unfaithfulness or breaking faith and often comes in the form of of a betrayal or like adultery or something like that 
And, and it is the idea that you have violated the spirit or the responsibilities of, of a relationship with God or with somebody else. You have been treacherous. You have betrayed uh, them and the nature of the relationship in the way that it's supposed to be. Another term the Bible uses for sin is the term perversion. And so perversion is to defile oneself spiritually with profane acts to evil gods. Or to, to, to defile oneself morally with sexual debauchery. And then the final word that I'm going to talk about that the Bible uses for sin is the word abomination. And abomination is when we participate in that which is detestable to God. When we open ourselves to and invite into our lives those things that are loathsome to God. And so this is like a super fun list, right? I mean, we're like, no, I mean, and, and that's exactly the point. It's not fun. And to be honest with you, me just kind of listing these different sins is awkward and uncomfortable and convicting. But it does change our perspective some. As we, as we see all of these different things listed, for one, it, it exposes the depravity of our own souls. It also reveals so much of the inner workings and the machinations of our own hearts and minds. And, and it's not good. Furthermore, I didn't even list specific sins. Like, you know, stealing, lying, gluttony, gossip, murder, adultery, you know, all of that. I didn't list any of those. Furthermore, I did not list any of the consequences of sin such as suffering, bondage, separation, brokenness, alienation, fear, punishment, and ultimately death. And, and so we go back to the story of Joseph, and we say, well, is this where Joseph is tracking? And, and I would say, honestly, I think there's some of that, but, but sin is even more than that. Or, or for him, it was. So for Joseph, it wasn't just the physical act that was the problem. And it wasn't just the consequences of the physical act that was the problem. For Joseph, it was that he wanted to honor God with his life. So he says, you know, how can I do this wicked thing and sin against the Lord? And so that brings us back to our, our primary verse. So the verse we're just kind of hanging these different ideas on, and that's the, 2 Timothy 2.22. And so in 2 Timothy 2.22, we see that there is a fleeing from and that there is a fleeing to. We are fleeing from the evil desires of youth and we are fleeing to righteousness, towards righteousness. We are fleeing from sin and we are fleeing towards God. Now there's a word in the Bible that unlocks this concept uh, all throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. And it is the word delight. That we are to delight ourselves in the Lord. That we are not to delight in sin, wickedness, error, treachery, iniquity. All, we are not to delight in all of those things that, that we just went through. But that's where our heart is, right? That's where so many of us are. We see those things and we covet them. We want them. We delight in these things. Instead, we are to delight ourselves in the Lord. And, and our joy, our satisfaction, our happiness, our life is found in the Lord. And so as Christians, we are to desire Jesus. We don't desire sin. You know, we, we want to reflect Him. We want to emulate Him. We want to rejoice in Him. And so our delight is not in sin. Our delight is in Jesus. And we see this all through Scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 43. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. Psalm 119.16, I delight in your decrees. 
Psalm 119, 47, I delight in your commandments because in your commands because I love them. Romans 7, 21, for in my inner being I delight in God's laws. And so because I delight in the Lord, sin is now repulsive to me. Still, it seeks me. It pursues me. It tries to entrap me. It tries to ensnare me. And so I run. I push it away. I try to create separation between me and sin. And not just because of the specific sin or because of the consequences of sin, but because my heart now belongs to God. Because I delight in the Lord. I think one of the easiest ways to communicate this is through the marriage relationship. So I'm madly in love with my wife. I love my wife. I, I desire to please her. I, I, I want my heart to be, to be true to her. My, you know, in, in my mind, my heart is, is reserved for her. And so I don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize that relationship. And so if someone makes advances towards me, then I'm going to push that person away. I'm going to flee from that situation. Why? Because I delight in my wife. My heart doesn't want this other thing. My heart wants my wife. And this is why the sin of adultery often creates so much pain and suffering. And, and, and it's not necessarily the physical act or necessarily the consequences of the act, although that's part of it. It is the fact that one party thought so little of the relationship, found so little delight in the relationship that it went seeking after something else. It's interesting that this is the exact metaphor that God uses so often when Israel sins against Him. In fact, i got to find where I am. Okay, Ezekiel 6.9. How I have been grieved by their adulterous hearts, which have turned away from me, and by their eyes, which have lusted after idols. God is upset, not only that they did not find satisfaction in Him, but satisfaction was found somewhere else. I think another way to illustrate this idea is with fandom. So, not too long ago, my beloved 49ers played the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl. And so I went and I dusted off my Joe Montana jersey. Now, now listen, at least I didn't wear it to church like some people. <laughs> like, like Colin when the Giants are in the Super Bowl, or, or Paul makes his whole family wear when, when the Patriots are in the Super Bowl. So anyway, I dusted off my Joe Montana jersey, got together with some friends to watch the game. And if someone was there who was, you know, a Chiefs fan, well, there's some good-natured banter, there's some trash talk, you know. But if someone had suggested especially during that game, at that moment, in that time, that I put on a Kansas City Chiefs jersey. And I don't have anything against the Chiefs. I like the Chiefs. But I would have, I would have been mortified. You know, there's no way I could, have, I could have put on that jersey, much less root for the Chiefs. That, just the very idea of that would have been repulsive to me. Someone would have had to physically hold me down to take off the 49er jersey and put a Chiefs jersey on. Why? Because my heart was reserved for another. And my heart, my heart could not conceive of participating in the act of wearing a Chiefs jersey and identifying with the Chiefs in that moment because my heart was inclined in a different way. And so this is how we Christians are to be with sin. It is repulsive to us and violates something deep inside of us that aspires to a higher ideal. And in this case, it is to know and to serve and to seek the living God. And so again, going back to Joseph. When Potiphar's wife made those, those advances, he did not see beauty. He did not see pleasure. He did not see desire. He saw rebellion and ignorance an error, an inattention, and missing the mark, and unrighteousness, and transgression, iniquity, 
treachery, perversion, abomination. And so he ran. He ran as fast as he possibly could. Why? Because his heart was given to another. Because his heart was captivated by another. And so I close with this. What is it that has captivated your heart? What has captured you? Is it rebellion? Inattention? Error? Iniquity? Treachery? Abomination? Or is it the Lord? Is it is it Jesus Himself? Is it, is it His Word? Is it His will? Is it His ways? You know, you know, what has captured you? What is it that your heart desires? And so as we look at this idea of, of following Jesus and who Jesus' followers are, Jesus' followers are people who, who flee from sin. We push it away. We don't just avoid it. We actively maintain uh, a posture of moving away from it, not necessarily just to avoid the act, although that's a big part of it, but because we want our lives to honor the Lord. And He has captured our hearts. And if our hearts are duplicitous, which honestly, all of them, all of our hearts are. And so the principle isn't that we're perfect and we always seek God and always flee from sin. The idea here is that there needs to be a moving away from. There needs to be a commitment to righteousness, a commitment to God, and an understanding in our own hearts that that our hearts belong to God, that we belong to Him, that we are set aside for Him, that we are chosen by Him, that He has something for us and we're so in love with Him and so committed to Him, and so devoted to Him, that just the thought of betraying Him and sinning against Him, that, that, that's repulsive to us. And that's where Joseph was. You know, again, it wasn't the act and all this other stuff. It was that his heart was for the Lord. That his heart wanted to please God and to serve Him. And so I want to challenge us today to examine our own hearts. You know, as as we're going through that list, I'll I'll be honest with you, I'm reading through some of that stuff and I'm going, oh man, this is convicting. And so as I'm reading through that list, and again, I'm not even going through specific sins, just how sin works in different ways, you know, and you're like, ugh. Um, You know, but to recognize the games that you're playing in your own mind, the rationalizations, the justifications, And make a renewed commitment to live righteously. You know, to to live a holy life before the Lord. And and to identify those areas of our lives that we need to flee. And so what is it in your life that you know is damaging your relationship with God? Where you're like the, you know, the out of shape, unhealthy person, you know, ordering the blooming onion, and you're rationalizing, well, you know, it's an onion. Um, You know, where are you doing that in your life? And so, I just want to challenge you to to, to basically survey your own heart and identify those things and, and, and and confess that to the Lord. Repent of that sin so that you can pursue God more wholly. And, and, and live a life pleasing to Him. Let's pray. Father.